are there any notices of motion? I call the Leader of the Opposition for his first question. Question time will conclude today at uh, 11.20 a.m. Mr Speaker, a question to the Premier. At a time when Queenslanders are banned from coming home, why has the Premier prioritised a sporting entourage over everyday Queenslanders? Yeah. I call the Premier. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question. And let me say from the outset, Mr Speaker, that uh, we want to see as many Queenslanders get home as safely as possible. That's why the government is already looking at um, uh, some extra um, uh, additional hotels that we'll be able to bring online to deal specifically with the domestic travel. The reason that the, the hotel quarantine system is packed at the moment is because we've had uh, so much international arrivals with the domestic arrivals, Mr Speaker, that's really stretched the resources, Mr Speaker. And uh, what also we've been doing is we've actually been taking in extra charter flights above that international cap. So we would have charter flights coming in from overseas that we weren't notified of basically until the day they arrived, which meant that our people, scrambling, our people were our people were scrambling, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Member so for Tour the South. Member for Tour South, Member for Corumban. My lip reading is working. Today, Premier has the call. That um, uh, many parents have been contacting us about their children who are in boarding schools, Mr. Speaker, and we are looking at a. Uh, we are, will be trialling a home quarantine with a specified app there to allow those students. Especially, you know, some of them are minors, Mr. Speaker. Um, I had an example just recently. I Order, Member for Kawana. We'll cease his interjections. We want people to come home when it's safe to do so, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Order. Order. Yes. And the mandatory quarantine is is what is needed to keep Queenslanders safe. That is the advice of the Chief Health Officer, Mr. Speaker. That's right. That's right. They wanted the borders open. That's right, Mr. Speaker. Order, um, members. Mr. Speaker, I might direct the member for Kwana to have a look at what's happening in New South Wales, Mr. Speaker. There are reports at the moment. Reports at the moment that their hospitals, that their hospitals. Pause the clock. Get Premier. Premier. Are Premier, to please resume your seat. Member for Corumban, you're warned under standing orders. Member for Kwana, you're warned under standing orders. And Member for Gregory, you're also warned under standing orders. It wasn't immediate, but it did come. Thank I call the Premier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Westmead Hospital is now only caring for those with COVID, while other patients have been moved into makeshift ICU, Mr Speaker. That's what's happening in New South Wales at the moment. And let me also say, Mr Speaker, New South Wales will not reach their peak until October this year, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, they are reporting around 12,000 cases a day over the last couple of days, Mr Speaker. We've had 1,900 during the entire pandemic in Queensland, Mr Speaker, and the member for Kiwana and those opposite are criticising us for keeping Queenslanders safe. Well, sorry, you're on the wrong side of the fence. The, the Premier's time has expired. I remind uh, all members that comments will be directed through the chair. The Leader of the Opposition, please uh, ask your second question. Uh, Mr Speaker, a question to the Premier. I refer to the Premier's comments that the sporting entourage is not counted in the cap. Sharon is a cancer patient stuck interstate following her mother's funeral. What does Sharon have to do to not be counted in the cap and return home to Queensland? <laughs> I call the Premier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And uh, people who, are, um, who have medical conditions are exempt from that cap, Mr Speaker. We have made that very, very clear, Mr Speaker. Very, very clear that the exemptions are separate to that cap, Mr Speaker. Now, in relation to, to that particular individual, the Health Minister has, has assured me that the exemptions unit is dealing personally with her, Mr Speaker. And that is the right thing to do, to go through the exemptions unit, Mr Speaker. But, Mr Speaker, let me quote this. So this is a very interesting quote, Mr Speaker. 
This is what someone said about the game. Mango. Let's just be very clear. Our people are passionate for the game. We've got the facilities and we're willing to play our role to keep the NRL season afloat. Yeah, who said that? Who said that? Oh, just look over there. The member for Toowoomba South. The member for Toowoomba South. So, you know, you know, you come in here. Come in here, Mr Speaker. Order! That's right. On that side of the house. On that side of the house. Yeah, nice own bowl there. You got into touch on that one. We try. So, Mr. Speaker, so, Mr. Speaker, we will work very closely. Mem <laughs> Someone with a very deep voice. Mem mem member for Tormen North, um, you warned understanding orders. <laughs> Premier has the Thank call. you, Mr Speaker. Look, I just remind those opposite to have a look what's happening down in, in New South Wales, Mr Speaker. That's not a laughing matter. That's not a laughing matter, Mr Speaker. That's not a laughing matter. And, and, if, and if Queenslanders had listened to, to this lot opposite, imagine where Queensland would be today having COVID because they call for the borders to be open. Mr Speaker, the Queensland uh, Health Officer takes all, um, all care in dealing with requests that come to her for a whole variety of reasons. The exemption unit has been increased because we know this is a very concerning time for families and we have moved quickly today in looking at prioritising those minors who are isolated away from their families in boarding schools or in other parts of Australia that need to come home to their families, Mr yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaker. And I, res I just remind those opposite too, as the Treasurer has said, it is states like Queensland and Western Australia that are continuing to function. Our economies are open. Yeah, Our economies, yeah. people are enjoying... Premier's our time our has expired. And that would all Premier's time has expired and I ask you to resume her seat. I call the member for Redlands. Mr Speaker, my question is of the Premier and Minister for Trade. Will the Premier update the House on the regional benefits of hosting the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games? I call the Premier. <laughs> no, the Deputy Premier was making a joke. Oh. Uh, order. Order, members. I'm not the one wearing a flowery mask. Well, all members, my back's feeling good today. I can stand up all day. <laughs> when the speaker stands, any presiding officer, the House will come to complete silence. There are no exceptions, and I expect that that will be adhered to. Member for um, Everton, uh, your interjections were designed to interrupt the Premier. You're warned under standing orders. Member for Nanga, you're also warned under standing orders. Premier, I ask you to withdraw the comment related to the Member for Everton. I withdraw. Thank you, Premier. You have the call. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I thank uh, the Member for the question. And as the Deputy Premier was reminding me, to which I said I already know, it is the member's birthday today, so yeah. the member for Redlands, a happy birthday. And uh, isn't she lucky to enjoy her birthday with all of us? <laughs> to which I said, for her birthday, you can ask me a question. But Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker many happy returns. And it's a significant birthday too. 21, that's right. If only. But Mr Speaker... Mr Speaker, the, um, the, the members raised a really good question and that's about the impact that the Olympics are going to have um, right across our regions, Mr Speaker. We know in the Redlands that the Redlands will be um, hosting the uh, Whitewater Centre, it will be built for the, the canoe event and the venue will have a capacity of 8,000 with a mixture of permanent and temporary grandstands. 
After the Olympics, it would continue as a whitewater centre, emergency service training and an adventure park, Mr Speaker. And as we know, the Olympics will benefit all of the state with events uh, across the southeast, but also in uh, Cairns and Townsville, uh, Toowoomba, uh, Ipswich, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast. There is something in this for everybody, Mr yeah. Speaker. And we also know that we have um, around 84 per cent of the venues already built, and that was, that was actually received very warmly by the International Olympic Committee. Uh, when we presented uh, to them in Tokyo uh, just recently. We know that there's going to be um, uh, a whole lot of opportunities for Queensland businesses to also uh, benefit from the Olympics, whether that is in relation to uh, procurement, uh, making sure that they uh, are able to tender for different works, and the fact that it is 11 years away gives us uh, time to plan. The other good news is if you think about uh, where the Olympics have been held, like Tokyo just recently, next is Paris and the next is LA, this is really sending a signal to the world that medium-sized cities such as Brisbane and a state such as Queensland can host such a magnificent world-class event. Yeah. The International Olympic Committee was also very positive towards the fact that we had hosted uh, the Commonwealth, a very successful uh, Commonwealth Games. And we know that the Olympics will also generate up to 100,000 jobs and also over $8 billion in economic and trade benefit for many, many years to come. So um, I ask all members to get behind it and to continue talking Mr. about Speaker, it right across the state. Mr. Speaker, time has expired. I call the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, a question to the Premier. Where is the health advice that permits an NRL entourage to enter the state while grieving Queenslanders are locked out of their home? I call the Premier. Mr Speaker, I, um, I thank the member for the question. There is an exemptions unit that deals with people who are either have uh, bereavement issues or medical issues. They are dealt separately to the cap. This is a pause for two weeks to enable our hotels to enable our hotels to be able to cope. We are at the stage where there was over 5,000 people in our hotel quarantine. There was one week where we had 1,900 people who rocked up to Queensland, Mr Speaker. We don't know when they're arriving. No, we don't know when they're arriving. They turn up and then our agencies have to scramble for hotels. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker in relation to the Chief Health Officer, she considers uh, separate issues on a daily basis, and can I uh, thank the Chief Health Officer for the outstanding work that she has done to the people of this state, Mr Speaker. Every day she gets up, like me and everybody else on my team, and we thank Queenslanders for the work that, we, that they are doing, Mr Speaker. I mean, in terms of having a double donut day, zero cases, the fact that Queensland was able to get on top of that delta so quickly to go so hard and so fast enables our economy to open up. And we've seen how good the economy is going with you know, 5.2 per cent unemployment and more than 90,000 jobs generated since the pandemic, Mr Speaker. This is in stark contrast to what's happening in New South Wales and Victoria, Mr Speaker. We have not seen anywhere near the peak of New South Wales. And if you want to see a health system in crisis, you will see it in the very near future in New South Wales, Mr Speaker. And Queensland stands ready to help, Mr Speaker, as does every other state and territory when that time comes. Mr Speaker, we don't know what the future holds. This book has not been written. These are uncharted times. But we will do everything in our power to make sure that Queensland continues on the path that it has been going. The exemptions unit will deal with exemptions, Mr Speaker, and the Chief Health Officer will make decisions in the best interests of our state. Mr. Mr. Speaker. Order. I call the member for Mirabur. Mr Speaker, my question is of the Premier and the Minister for Trade. Will the Premier update the House on how the Palaszczuk government's economic recovery plan is delivering uh, and creating jobs for Queenslanders, and is the Premier aware of any alternative approaches? I call the Premier. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for Maribara for the question. 
And uh, Mr Speaker, our economic plan is working. And why is our economic plan working? Because we've been able to get on top of the health issues, Mr yeah, Speaker, yeah. To, deal, to deal with COVID, Mr <laughs> Speaker. And in Maribara, we have uh, the example of we have the $600 million rolling stock expansion program where we're procuring initial 20 new six-car passenger trains to be uh, manufactured in Maribara, an election commitment, Mr Speaker, but also to we're seeing um, the supports going into the local Maribara hospital, Mr yeah. Speaker, upgrades to roads, the schools. Yeah. Every time I, I go to Maribara, Bruce, the, the member has something new to show me, um, yeah. whether it's Works for Queensland money going into the local uh, parks, Mr yeah. Speaker. This is a member who delivers for his community, Mr yeah. Speaker. Puts them first, putting Maribara first. Um, but, Mr Speaker, we also know that um, uh, those opposite, you know, you know, one minute they're all together, next minute they're split apart. But it was really interesting to see some comments that were made. I think it was around the time of the Stretton by-election. Now we know those opposite. I think they had like a one in a million candidate or something. That's right. That's right, Mr. Speaker. Um, well, Mr. Speaker, the, the day after the by-election. Someone had a bit of a dummy spit, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Campbell Newman. Uh, Campbell Newman. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, don't get so excited here because I wouldn't be surprised if it's just an LNP setup, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. You know, once with the LNP, always with the LNP, Mr. Speaker. And I don't know how, you know, the, the, uh, how Newman's apprentice, Newman's apprentice over there, you know. The old right-hand man, you know, he was probably there. Just pretend to leave the LNP. Just go over there. Look up some, you know, fringe votes for us, and then you'll be able to come back, Mr. Speaker. Honestly, honestly, it has to be all pre-arranged, Mr. Speaker. We smell something there that's not quite right, Mr. Speaker. So that's right. That's right. We'll see what's happened. We'll that's right, that's right. That, well, they used to call for the borders to be open. So it'll be interesting to see where he's getting his instructions from. But, Mr Speaker, on this side of the House, we will continue with our economic recovery. We will continue to make sure that we have growth across our state, Mr Speaker. And we will continue with our strong health response, Mr Speaker. And we will continue to put in place those necessary measures that are needed to keep Queenslanders safe. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Kiwana. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question to the Premier. If Queensland hospitals are for Queenslanders, why aren't Queensland quarantine host hotels also for Queenslanders? Uh, before calling the Premier, uh, Leader of the House, uh, you'll put your comments through the Chair. I call the Premier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the case of Member for Kwana wasn't listening. There are exemptions there for people who need access to medical services who have bereavement issues, Mr Speaker. That is separate to the cap. We've got a pause at the moment, Mr Speaker, so our, so our quarantine system can ease. And, Mr Speaker, what is one of the reasons that have been putting pressure on our quarantine system is that we are taking above the cap that has been set for international arrivals, Mr Speaker. If the cap comes below what it's supposed to be, Mr Speaker, we can take more people coming into Queensland. So perhaps the member for Kwana might want to pick up the phone to his friend, the Prime Minister, down in Canberra and ask him as to why that is not happening. We are getting charter flights that, are, that are, we are finding out on the day, scrambling to get hotels because this is above the cap that was set by the federal government, Mr Speaker. And just to clarify again for the House, in relation to the, the, uh, the uh, refugees coming from Afghanistan, that is separate to the cap, Mr Speaker. So we're trying to do everything we possibly can, but over 5,000 people coming into Queensland was going to put stress on the system. It was going to stretch our resources, Mr Speaker, and we had to get that under control. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Ipswich West. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is of the Deputy Premier and Minister for State Planning, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning. Can the Deputy Premier update the House on the progress of providing quarantine facilities in Queensland? 
I call the Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Ipswich West for his question. I know that he knows that keeping Queenslanders safe is the foundation of our economic recovery. And if we're going to continue to keep Queenslanders safe, we need fit for purpose quarantine facilities. Hotel quarantine was incredibly valuable in the early stages of the pandemic, but it has let us down with the Delta strain. Leaks from hotel quarantine have led to outbreaks here, but more devastatingly, in New South Wales. We need new options for quarantine, not just urgently, it's not just urgent, it is in fact overdue. And that's why I was pleased last week to join the Premier at Wellcamp Airport to announce that we would build a new purpose-built accommodation uh, facility there in what is the perfect location. It is adjacent to an international airport. It has a buffer from residential areas. It is a greenfield site ready to build on. And in fact, construction is underway right now. Mr Speaker, the Doherty Institute says that quarantine will continue to be necessary even when we meet those vaccination targets. And if we had have got the go-ahead to build it when we first suggested it in January, we would have it built right now. We would be using it right now. But we got sick of the excuses from the political masters of those opposite. Let's run through the Prime Minister's excuses, shall we? First of all, he said there wasn't enough detail. So we gave him a lot more detail. Then he said, then he said, big planes can't land there. And so we sent him a picture of his big plane on the tarmac after it had landed there. And then he said, and then he said, it's in the desert. And we said, no, no, Toowoomba is not in the desert. And then when we announced it, what did he say? Oh, you should have done it months ago. After all the excuses, he said, you should have done it months ago. Well, where they are failing, we are acting. Where Morrison has failed on the vaccination rollout, Queensland Health has stepped in and are delivering. And where Morrison failed on quarantine, we are stepping in and we are building a dedicated quarantine facility. The first 500 beds will be ready by Christmas. The next 500 in the first quarter of next year, months ahead months ahead of the Commonwealth's proposed pink and bar facility that won't be online until closer to the middle of the year. Uh, Honourable Members, um, apologies for the interruption to question time. We have received advice from the Queensland Police of a possible protest activity, including attempted intrusion of the precinct. Uh, as a precautionary measure, Queensland Police advise that the precinct should be locked down until the protest uh, protest activity has ceased. I've directed uh, the implementation of this advice. This includes no access in or out of the precinct during the lockdown period, and further advice will be provided uh, as it comes to hand. Thank you. I call the member for Thank Madhuribar. Thank you, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question to the Health Minister. Ca sorry. Can the Minister guarantee all surgeries performed at Caboolture Hospital have been done by surgeons qualified to perform them. I call the Minister for Health. Um, I thank the member for his question. And, um, the issues raised uh, both in yesterday's media reports and today are very serious allegations. Uh, when uh, I was first contacted uh, mid-July uh, in relation to these allegations, I sought advice from Caboolture Hospital and Metro North HHS in relation to those specific allegations and those the ones that were reported yesterday. I can advise that um, each of those allegations uh, were thoroughly investigated by the Caboolture Hospital's Performance Management Committee, but some of those, of course, at least one of those have gone to the coroner, and the coroner has chosen not to further investigate in relation to that particular um, deceased person. Of course, the Department of Health have also, and through the Clinical um, Excellence Queensland, have been doing additional work. But there has been additional claims made today. So, uh, in addition to the information I received yesterday, because the media report said today uh, that there were people coming forward on social media 
raising concerns about the care they received, I can advise today, Mr Speaker, uh, that we are setting up a phone line uh, for people to be able to ring in, because I want to know if there's issues. Now, I don't make any, any preconceived allegations around Caboolture Hospital. Can I say, I know the staff there work extremely hard each and every day to provide quality care to, to the patients. But I want to make sure that if there's people out there who do not believe that they've had the care at the, at the level that they believe they deserve, then they should come forward and provide us with the information so it can be properly considered. And I want them to do that. Um, and and it, it needs to occur not just on social media or through media reports, but coming forward to the authorities. So can I advise the House that Queensland Health is establishing a dedicated phone line available to anyone who wants to raise concerns about the treatment they have received at Caboolture Hospital. They can phone uh, 3647 9559. It will become available from midday today. It will be open from 8am to 5pm, seven days a week, and it will be staffed by a clinical nurse consultant. I am setting this up to ensure that anyone who has any genuine complaints can come forward and they can be properly considered and investigate. Um, I, I advise the member that I have been um, advised by the Department of Health. I am answering the member's question. I am answering the member's question. There are various bodies that complaints can be raised to, as the member knows, both the hospital. Order, members. Members to my left. Mr. Speaker. The minister's time has expired. I call the member for Cairns. Mr. Speaker, my question is of the Treasurer and Minister for Investment. Will the Treasurer update the House on the impact the Federal Government's withdrawal of JobKeeper is having in far north Queensland? Uh, sorry, uh, Treasurer. Members to my left, questions will be heard in silence. That includes no moaning, no groaning or any other interjection. The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Speaker. I thank the member for Cairns for his question, a very serious question that impacts on the people of not just the far north but all parts of Queensland. The member for Cairns knows full well the burden COVID-19 uh, has had on far north Queensland. Right back to the start of last year, when it was known only as a novel coronavirus. Far north Queensland was the first place where the Palaszczuk government announced an economic support package. And credit where credit is due, the federal government's JobKeeper program enabled many businesses in Cairns and the region to keep their heads above water. It's exactly why our government pleaded with Scott Morrison to continue JobKeeper. Because one thing we have learned from COVID, and that is that the virus is relentless. It mutates, it seeks to infect every human being it comes Leader contact. of the Opposition, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Today, businesses in Cairns are open and able to trade uh, because the people of the far north de defeated the latest Delta outbreak. But their customers cannot reach them because of the closure of international borders and, of course, severe lockdowns, long prolonged lockdowns in New South Wales and Victoria. That is why JobKeeper, Speaker, should have never been withdrawn. And that's why JobKeeper is required right now, as, as much as it has ever been, it is required right now. That should come as a surprise to no one. It comes as a, no surprise to the member for Cairns or the member for Cook or the member for Barron River or even you, Speaker. Yet somehow it came as a surprise member for Budrum. to Warren Inch, Speaker. Moments after we announced a jointly funded $600 million package, what did he do? Pause the clock. Pause the clock. He missed Pause the, the clock, um, opportunity Treasurer, to please, up to his region. Please resume your seat. Member for Budrum, you warned. Understanding orders, you're making no attempt besides the mask to uh, mask the interjection. Treasurer, you have the call. He missed the unique opportunity to stand up for his region, to do his job, Speaker. We all know, of course, that Warren Hench was very happy to use his power and his number in the party room to bring down Malcolm Turnbull. He's the fellow that caused Malcolm Turnbull to lose the Prime Ministership. But when he is called on to stand up for his community, he does absolutely nothing. Because it is typical 
of the spinelessness of the LNP. Uh, those Speaker. comments are unparliamentary. Those comments are unparliamentary. I ask you to withdraw. I withdraw, Speaker. It is typical of the lack of courage and the weakness and the cowardice of the LNP. Speaker, call it what you may. That is typical of the LNP. So today I call on Warren Inch to do Leader of your the opposition. job, Speaker. I call on Warren Inch to do your job. And of course the Leader of the Opposition will do Order. nothing. The Leader of the Opposition will do nothing. He will, he's happy to bleed in this House, happy to interject, but will not stand up for Queensland. He won't stand up. The Leader of the Opposition won't stand up to Warren Inch. He won't call on him to use his power, use his power to bring back JobKeeper. So I say, Warren Inch, Scott Morrison, do your job and bring back JobKeeper. Treasurer's time has expired. The Leader of the Opposition, you're warned under standing orders. Uh, I call the member for model. Mr Speaker, a question uh, to the Health Minister. Can the Minister confirm that there was not a permanent or acting Director of Surgery at Caboolture Hospital for five months in 2020? I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm happy to follow up on that uh, for the member. <laughs> Mr Speaker. I call the member for Aspley. Uh, my question is of the Minister for Education, Minister for Industrial Relations and Minister for Racing. Can the Minister advise the House of the arrangements made to adjust the Year 12 exam timetable and accommodate the People's Long Weekend at the end of October? Yes. I call... Yeah. Member for Nenango, you're under warning. Uh, you can leave the chamber for one hour. Aww. Feel no pity, Member uh, for... Uh, 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 McConnell, um, the <laughs> member knows full well. I call the Minister for Education. And thank you, Speaker. And I thank the member for Aspie for the question because I know his constituents are very much looking forward to the public holiday on Friday, the 29th of November. And um, can I say that it coincides with World Teachers Day? And listen to them opposite already. No vision. No alternatives, not anything coming from them. And you've got all these North Coast and South Coast MPs complaining that their hotels are full. Oh. And what I've heard is when we announce the, da the, the date, the day after, the traffic on holiday letting websites went up six thousand percent. Let me just add that again. Six thousand percent. And what did we hear from the members on the Gold Coast? Nothing. Come to the Gold Coast on the long weekend. We'll welcome you. No, nothing at all. The member for Corumba and a lot to say about lockdown, helping those New South Wales people over the barricades into Queensland. You want a leg up? I'll give you a leg up. Come on in. Come on in. You're fine. Yet when it comes to the economic boost that moving this public holiday is going to give to Queensland, silence from both the Sunshine Coast and the Gold Coast members. Well, we're here to look after those businesses. And it was wonderful to work with the Minister for Tourism. We spoke to the tourism sector and they were very keen on the economic benefits that occurred when unfortunately the ECHO got cancelled last year and we moved the public holiday to the Friday. The economic benefits were incredible and they were keen to repeat that again with another Friday. Now, the school holidays actually finish on the 5th of October. And when you look at the window of opportunity between that day and um, schoolies starting in mid-November, there's not a lot of Fridays and Mondays left. And to, and to suggest by the opposition um, um, minister for education that somehow we left no stone unturned in deciding this, um, this date is absolutely completely wrong. Um, and I really do welcome the QCAA, the non-government, government sector coming together, and it was very easy. We moved the exam period, which I addressed at the press conference, Speaker, I might add. Yeah. I, I addressed it straight away, like as if we didn't know the exam period. Very simple, very simple thing to do moved from the, from the 29th to the 22nd, and I thank them very much for doing that. But rather than whinging and whining coming from those opposite, you would think they'd have some vision. 
You would think that they would want to have the economic boost that this public holiday is going to provide to the, to the tourism sector. But what do you get? Stone Mr. Silence. Speaker, the Minister's time has expired. I call the member for Glasshouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A question to the Premier. Who is ultimately responsible if it is found botched surgeries cause death in Queensland public hospitals? I call the Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. If the member has any um, allegations, uh, we're happy to look at those, uh, <clears throat> those allegations, Mr Speaker. Um, so, but, Mr Speaker, I will remind uh, the member opposite as well, Mr Speaker, about um, he might want to have a close look at what's happening in New South Wales at the moment to see the overwhelming, the overwhelming response that is happening, that is happening with dealing with the Delta virus, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, in some hospitals, my understanding is they're not doing any surgery. They're not doing because people have COVID and they are dying from COVID, and they are not at the peak. The peak is in October. October. Order. So, Mr. Speaker. Uh, if, if, the, if the member has any allegations about anything specific, please raise it with the health minister, and the health minister will get back to the member. But there seems to be a denial on that side about what is happening That's in right. New South Wales and Victoria, Mr Speaker. A denial, an absolute denial about what is happening down there. Well, on this side of the House, we'll do everything we can to prevent that Delta outbreak happening here, Mr Speaker. Um, but we will be ready in case it comes, and we will once again go hard and go fast, Mr Speaker. And I thank Queenslanders for their hard work. Mr Speaker. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, is there a point of order? Yeah, just a point of order on matters suddenly arising. I think I inadvertently may have said 29th of November at some stage. Of course, it's Friday the 29th of October. I just want to correct the record, Mr Speaker. I, uh, Thank you. Uh, order, Member for Chatsworth. Um, that's that is not the worst. That's not the worst mistake you can make, Minister. An extra public holiday. Uh, can I just also, before calling the member, um, advise members: if you are um, interjecting, please do not remove your mask uh, for two reasons. One, it's a health issue, and two, it's very, very obvious. I call the member for Jordan. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is of the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services. Can the Minister update the House on the pressures on the health system in Queensland and how they compare to other jurisdictions? I call the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and uh, take the Premier's interjection. Um, and I... Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Jordan for her question. And as we know, uh, all health systems across the country are under incredible strain right now. Uh, member, certainly, I'll take sorry. that interjection. It wasn't in a good space under the LNP, that's for sure. Uh, Minister, Minister, pause the clock. Um, member for Madurabar, you are warned under standing orders. Uh, those comments were clearly not directed through the chair. They were directed towards the minister. I call the Minister for Health. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And, um, yeah, I, again, I don't think the LNP can talk about the health system when uh, they still have not acknowledged and apologised for what they did to uh, the health system and the sacking of staff. But, Mr Speaker, um, look, the system has been under incredible pressure. We're very proud of the investment uh, that we have made, including in this year's budget and the additional funding that we have put in uh, to open up additional beds. And, in fact, uh, on top of the $100 million prior to the budget for Care for Queensland, an extra $163.5 million to uh, provide another 351 beds available in the next 12 months. So this will help with some of those pressures, but we also need to understand that the pressures um, keep having peaks and troughs. And the reason why is because our staff are doing such an incredible job of playing catch-up and then we end up having an outbreak and then we have lockdowns. And so the most le recent lockdown not only slowed down elective surgery again, but we had over 400 health workers in quarantine. And as of today, because of the outbreak that started on the 31st of July, we still have some health workers in quarantine today because they are family members 
of uh, the Indrapilli cluster. So that had a significant impact as well. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, we know that jurisdictions across the country are doing it tough. Even Western Australia, uh, prior to the most two recent cases, um, had announced that they were putting a suspension on their elective surgery. Sydney is actually turning away COVID patients. It is so distressing to hear what is happening in Victoria and New South Wales right now, where people are being turned away and, sadly, people who are being managed by the health system in their homes are dying from COVID. Dying from COVID. And actually, one in five people who have died from COVID in the current New South Wales cluster, which is now over 20,000 people involved in that cluster who have been positive, one in five have actually contracted it while they were in hospital and then died as a consequence. So this is what we have fought for 19 months to stop happening. This is why we have tried so hard. We've stockpiled, we've trained, we've converted and uh, transitioned our hospitals to have these negative pressure rooms to do everything we can so that people don't die at home and people don't get turned away who are positive patients and we don't run out of ventilators. That's what we have done and worked hard to avoid. I'm very proud of our health workers. I'm proud of our Chief Health Officer. I'm proud of being part of the Palaszczuk Government and the great work that we're doing. Speaker. I call the member for Maywa. Speaker, my question this morning is to the Minister for Health. Today is Overdose Awareness Day. Despite Queensland being the second highest state for pharmaceutical overdose deaths, we're the only state without any federal or state funding to supply naloxone, which reverses the effects of opioid overdose. Will the minister commit to fund frontline alcohol and other drug workers to supply free, life-saving naloxone, or is the government too afraid of being seen as soft on drugs? I call the Minister for Health. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for his question. Um, putting aside the cheap political comment at the end there, this is a very serious issue. Um, and when you talk about mental health, when you talk about crime, when you talk about youth crime, uh, when you talk about homelessness, you have to talk about drug and alcohol as well. Uh, you have to acknowledge that this forms part of all of those issues and they're all interlinked. Uh, in fact, I raised this with the Assistant Minister of the Commonwealth responsible for mental health and said, the National Partnership Agreement that we are negotiating now on mental health, will there be a dedicated funding stream for drug and alcohol support? That the Commonwealth steps up and supports us in targeting this area, understanding how important that is in the mental health? And the answer was no. No, we are not having any dedicated funding in this space. We'll continue to, to uh, talk about funding in the broader concept, but we're not funding any particular programs or facilities. Uh, we have uh, got strategies around drug and alcohol, uh, but the job's never done in this space. It is a very, very difficult area, and we know it's a growing area. But we can talk about drugs, you only need to listen to our Queensland Mental Health Commissioner, who will tell you the consequences of alcohol as well and the impact that that is having on our community, um, which can be far greater still. So we have to tackle both of these areas. Um, I don't think any government should be closed off to any ideas. You have to be willing to look at all models, all initiatives, what works and what doesn't around the globe, because no one's had all the answers to this. No one has solved the problem of drug and alcohol abuse and addiction. But we are absolutely committed on working on these areas, working with stakeholders, uh, both public and private, uh, working with all three levels of government. Uh, and importantly, I hope that the member also is ensuring that his colleagues are asking these questions of the Commonwealth, because I know those opposite won't ask that question. Uh, they won't ask why the Commonwealth aren't investing in drug and alcohol, why they're not playing their part, why they're not considering that as part of the negotiations under the National Partnership on Mental Health. But I'll continue to raise the issue because we can't do this alone. We can't fund everything out alone. And the Commonwealth just keeps stepping back on all of their responsibilities when it comes to health, mental health, NDIS and aged care. All of these areas, housing, I'll take that interjection from the Treasurer, um, and we need more support financially, resources from the Commonwealth as well, because this is not just a Queensland problem, it is a national problem. Uh, but as I say to the member, we are committed to looking at all initiatives. I won't rule anything in or out, but I'm not playing cheap top politics with this issue. I'm not too scared to look at anything. We will look at what works and what doesn't, and we will make sure we work on evidence-based policy, because that's what the Palaszczuk government always has and always will do. Speaker. Speaker. Order. I call the member for Keppel. 
My question is of the Minister for Transport and Main Roads. Can the Minister update the House on the Government's record investment in regional roads? I call the Minister. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the member for Keppel, a great advocate for regional roads and getting a lot done in her electorate of Keppel. Uh, Speaker, over the last 18 months, we've seen more than $1.5 billion in new and accelerated funds going out onto regional roads as part of this government's response to the COVID pandemic. We've, as part of our four stimulus packages, we're seeing more than 2,700 jobs directly supported. And anyone who goes out into rural uh, Queensland and country Queensland can just see how much is getting done. The level of uh, positive feedback from mayors is very, very strong, with more than 95 per cent of that outside of TMR's metropolitan region, Mr Speaker. More than, uh, more than uh, most of that $1.5 billion um, uh, is going out. Sorry, uh, Minister. Please resume your seat. Pause the clock. <laughs> Member for Southern Downs. <laughs> You're more understanding of us. Thank you, Member for McConnell. I call the minister. It is good to see the enthusiasm over there from the member of Southern Down, Mr Speaker. So, Mr Speaker, the road safety is very much our, our commitment. $1.7 billion over four years have been allocated to road safety initiatives specifically. That means more overtaking lanes, better intersections, widening, sealing. We're going to seal $100 million worth of dirt roads to sealing as part of the stimulus, uh, Speaker. And in the Callide electorate itself, can I just say, in the Calide electorate, we're doing 55 road upgrades worth almost $200 million over the next four years, something the member for Calide doesn't inform his electorate of at all, Mr Speaker. And I make that point because only weeks ago, uh, the estimates committee process happened, of which the member for Calide is actually on the committee, paid $24,000 annually to be on the committee and contribute, and he did not ask one question. He did not say one word. Order. Member for Chatsworth will cease his objections. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm sorry, order, Minister Mr. Paul. Please resume your seat. What is your point of order? Arose on a matter of privilege suddenly arising. The minister had indicated on Twitter this was the case. I corrected him because I looked at the Hansard. The member for Calide did ask questions during the interview. Uh, no, no. Please, 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 resume, please resume your seat, Member for Kawana. This is not a I'll point of order. You, Mr. Speaker, that is a separate issue. That is a separate issue, Parliament. and I will uh, look at your correspondence and I'll give it con consideration at that time. I call the Minister for Transport and Main Roads. Speaker, the member for Calide did not ask me a single question in four hours of estimates committee. Not, not one. He, he might be, Mr. Speaker. He talks big on social media. Media, but he's quiet as a church mouse when he comes to Parliament, Mr. Speaker. And he wants to take that silent treatment. He wants to take that silent treatment to Canberra now, running for the federal seat of Flynn, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, he wants to be elected. He calls himself the voice of rural Queensland, but he's more Marcel Marceau, Speaker. You know, the, the, and maybe Canberra needs a Marcel Marceau, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but that kind of silent treatment is just fake. It is fake, Mr Speaker. It's not good enough to go out there on social media and to, to be all tough and then come in here and not do your job and, and, and give, dish out the silent treatment. Speaker, the roads in Calide are so good that I hear that they're so good that, that I hear that the former member for Sandgate, who under the Newman government, is being encouraged to join the Chinchilla branch, Mr Speaker, travelling along our regional roads to join the LNP Chinchilla branch to run in case the member for Calide gets up in Flynn. They can't even find a local candidate in Calide. They've got to import a former Newman government MP from South East Queensland, Mr Speaker, into the Chinchilla branch. That's how bare Mr. the Speaker. cupboard is, Mr Speaker. The That's member's how time has expired. I call the member for evidence. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Health Minister. Can the Minister confirm that all surg surgery, surgical deaths at Caboolture Hospital in the past 12 months have been fully investigated? I call the Minister for Health. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for evidence for his question. As the member uh, should be aware, um, not every death is investigated. Unexpected deaths um, are automatically um, referred to the coroner, and the coroner makes decisions as to whether there is uh, an investigation that needs to occur in relation to those deaths. Um, I'm aware, as I say, uh, one of the three that were referred to in the Courier Mail article yesterday, um, the death, uh, was referred to the coroner and they chose not to further investigate. So uh, I have no information before me that in any way says that any deaths that are unexpected, haven't been 
referred to the relevant authorities and properly investigated and considered by the coroner. Uh, in putting the question to me, if the member is asserting there has been, by all means, contact my office today and provide me with that information, because simply putting these questions, uh, making statements about bungled surgeries and deaths, without any evidence saying it is an offence on the people who work every day in our public health system to attack them and make allegations without making sure you have the evidence to back that up. Mr Speaker, they come in here asking these open-ended questions which do make an imputation on the health system. These questions today are making an imputation about the quality of care being provided by the health system. Now, as the health minister, if there is not care being delivered at the, the quality and the standard that we expect, I want it being investigated and I want action. But let's make sure that it's not done on a letter that says I have it on good authority, which is what I was sent in mid-July. I have it on good authority. This has happened. Make sure that the information is brought forward to the relevant authorities, and whether it's uh, to the HHS, whether it is to the Director General and the Department of Health, whether it's to the Health Ombudsman, whether it is to the coroner, whether it is to my office. There is many channels to raise allegations around genuine complaints around the quality of care in any public health system in Queensland, and they will be investigated. But don't simply come in and say, have any of these deaths been investigated? Leading, putting out there that somehow there hasn't been, that there's been unexplained deaths that have been you know, shoved under the carpet. The fact is that there are processes in place that the hospital and the HHS are required to follow. And if those on the other side have any information that says that has not occurred, then by all means bring it forward. And bring it forward to the C if you think that there is any serious corruption allegations. Don't just do it through the media and in this parliament. Mr. Speaker. Minister's time has expired. I call the member for Rockhampton. Mr. Speaker, my question is of the Minister for Energy, Renewables and Hydrogen and Minister for Public Works and Procurement. Will the Minister update the House on how important its policies to develop Queensland as a renewable energy superpower is to Queensland's economic recovery? I call the Minister for Energy. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. And can I start by acknowledging the member for Rockhampton's dedication to his role as one of Queensland's three hydrogen champions? And, uh, Speaker, the question is important because our nation is at an historic crossroads. It's important because we know that the policy decisions that we make now will determine the future for generations to come. And, Speaker, history will record that in Queensland we have made the right policy decisions. It will show our historic economic recovery. It will show our historic jobs growth, 300,000 more Queenslanders in jobs now than before the pandemic. It will show historically high levels of investment in Queensland. And from this, it will show historically high levels of investment in renewable energy projects in Queensland. In fact, Mr Speaker, 192 projects proposed at the moment. And it will show the largest energy budget in Queensland history, Mr Speaker. History will record. Under the Palaszczuk government, investment in renewable energy is at an historic high. In fact, 60 gigawatts of renewable energy projects proposed. Now, Speaker, this government is taking another historic step. I can inform the House that for the first time in history, structured consultation with regional communities across Queensland will maximise the local benefits from renewable energy developments. Regional communities can have their say now on how renewable projects are developed to benefit them and to benefit their families. Consultation is now open and for the benefit of the House I table this historic consultation paper and I urge members representing regional communities to encourage their constituents to have their say, to have their say about how they will truly benefit. And Speaker, the other fact that history will record is this. When it comes to driving investment in renewables in Queensland, we are going it alone, Speaker, just as Queensland is going it alone with the much needed well camp quarantine facility, Mr Speaker. History will record that Prime Minister Scott Morrison just does not back Queensland, whether it's in the battle against COVID 
or supporting the job opportunities that come with investment in renewable energy. History will also record, Speaker, it was the LNP in Queensland that wants to turn back the clock, backing nuclear, not renewable, Speaker, backing new coal, costing and causing existing plants to shut down. Regional Queensland, Speaker, should not be ground zero. Regional Queensland should not be ground zero for dangerous, expensive or outdated technology, Mr Speaker. History will record that it was Prime Minister Scott Morrison that wanted to hold Queensland back on renewables, just as he has held this state back on the battle against COVID, Mr Speaker. His preferences for energy are discredited and they're dangerous, Mr Speaker, just like his rollout of the vaccine, Mr Speaker. History will record it was Prime Minister Scott Morrison that failed this nation on quarantine, on vaccine and on renewable energy. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Tuller North. Mr Speaker, a question to the Health Minister. Can the Minister guarantee Caboolture Hospital won't lose its surgical accreditation with the Royal Australian College of Surgeons? I call the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for his question. I understand reaccreditation is going on right now. Draft report has been provided uh, that shows that it's a favourable outcome. I'll wait for the final accreditation. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Mackay. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is of the Minister for Tourism, Industry Development and Innovation and the Minister for Sport. Will the Minister inform the House if there is any further assistance available for operators of marine tourism operators with berthing costs for their vessels? And is the Minister aware of any alternative um, approaches? I call the Minister for Tourism. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for the question and, and acknowledge uh, her keen advocacy for the recovery of the tourism industry in the Mackay and Winstonday's region and the advocacy of so many other members uh, around this uh, issue. The Palaszczuk government has committed uh, $1 billion in direct support for Queensland's tourism operators during the pandemic, and we are continuing to listen. Marine uh, tourism operators have told us that they need ongoing help with the cost of berthing fees in privately owned marinas. And the Palaszczuk government is, from today, rolling out a second $3 million round of our COVID-19 marine tourism assistance scheme. It will provide up to $20,000 to operators up until 30 June next year. This is part of the government's recently announced $47.75 million tourism and hospitality sector lockdown package. Uh, last year's first round, Mr Speaker, saw 130 applications approved from Port Douglas to the Fraser Coast. After feedback from operators, we've made this second round even easier. Marine uh, tourism operators will no longer have to pay their berthing fees up front to be eligible to apply. This second round of support underscores the importance of marine operators to the industry in delivering first-class visitor experiences. Uh, we know lockdowns in New South Wales and Victoria have locked out more than 80 per cent of Queensland's tourism customers, and that's having an ongoing uh, huge impact to the industry. But we equally know that uh, industry has noted on numerous occasions that they want to see more action from the federal government. They want to see more action from the federal tourism minister, uh, Dan Tian. And I, and I note uh, the remarks made by the, the Treasurer earlier today, uh, that's why we need JobKeeper. And that's why I've written to Mr Tian backing calls from Queensland's tourism industry for the federal government to deliver a targeted JobKeeper-style uh, wage subsidy. Uh, emergency measures are desperately needed to sustain Queensland's tourism and hospitality industry until business capacity, confidence and visitors are restored. Uh, it's time also, Mr Speaker, for those opposite to put that pressure on the federal government as well to step up while there's still a Queensland tourism industry to throw a lifeline to. Uh, JobKeeper, as uh, the, the Treasurer said earlier, was an extraordinarily important package which sustained and helped uh, all Australians uh, so significantly through the desperate uh, situations of the pandemic last year. But the, it cutting, being cut off in the way that it was has caused extraordinary pain, particularly to the tourism sector and to other sectors of our economy who have not been able to recover in the same way due to the remaining closure of international borders and the extensive lockdowns that we've now seen in Victoria and, uh, and uh, sorry, in Victoria and New South Wales, and the impact that that's had, particularly on our Queensland tourism industry. So a targeted response that continues that sort of support, not just to aviation workers, but to others in our important tourism sector is what's vitally needed, and I call on everyone to support and raise their voice up with the federal government. Mr. Thomas has expired. I call the member for Butterham. 
Mr Speaker, a question to the Health Minister. Sunshine Coast resident Cynthia has been waiting on the Sunshine Coast hospital waitlist since September 2020. She's been told that, and I quote, she may be offered an appointment in January 2022, end quote. How long will Cynthia have to suffer in pain on Queensland's ballooning hospital wait lists before she can receive surgery? Uh, the period for question time has expired. <laughs> I'm sorry, Member. Um, I did want to interrupt your question. Uh, order, Members. Members will leave the chamber quietly if you are doing so, uh, as a courtesy to other, uh, other Members. I call the Leader of the House.